It's almost 2025, and with the RTX 5090 just around the corner, you might feel like you need the newest and fastest gaming PC just to keep up with modern games. But let me ask you this, do you even care about 2024 games? Because if we take a look at the top 10 most popular games right now, every single one has been out for at least 4 years, except for Overwatch 2. And a big reason for why these older games are still so popular is that anyone can play them, even if you have a potato PC. However, I can't say the same about games released in the past couple years. You're telling me I need an RTX 2080 just to meet the recommended specs for a game that looks basically the same as something from 2015. So as newer titles become more and more demanding with not enough content to offer, even the RTX 4090 is struggling to keep up with its own generation. So is there even a point in upgrading your PC anymore? Well, personally, I've been having a blast on my 2020 graphics card, and my old gaming laptop still holds up. And with my favorite games being old enough to vote, I might never have to upgrade my PC again. But this got me thinking, just how much farther can I push these older computers? So today, I'm taking that idea to the extreme, adding 20 extra years to my PC, and I'm gonna optimize this 24-year-old computer until it can play anything. Now you're probably wondering how I got this old computer to play anything, or how I managed to get my hands on a PC that's 5 years older than me. Well, it might come as a surprise to you, but I do actually have something called a dad, and this was his very first computer that he got back in 2000. Anyways, you're probably just as curious as I am about the specs and what's actually inside this PC, because this thing is massive. It absolutely dwarfs my Dell Optiplex in terms of size, and as for the weight, this rectangular prism comes in at 28.8 pounds, more than double the weight of the Optiplex. So you'd think with all that size and weight, there must be some crazy advanced technology inside. Or at least, advanced in 2000, because with an Intel Pentium inside, we might not be able to play anything, and with no graphics card, we might not be able to see anything, because the Intel Pentium 4 that we have right here does not come with integrated graphics, which would mean that it can't display anything on your monitor by itself. So now the big question is, how the hell did my dad even use this PC if it couldn't display an image? Well, the answer is the motherboard, because up until the 2010s, it was normal to put integrated graphics in the motherboard. Not so much anymore though. But let's be honest here, motherboard graphics are not gonna get us anywhere in gaming, which is why I got myself a bag of graphics cards that totally weren't stolen from my local orphanage, so it's time to figure out which one to use. Option 1 is this NVIDIA Riva TNT2 M64 Vanta graphics card, and if I said that without the context of a 24 year old computer, you would think that it sounds like it packs a serious punch but it really only performs about as good as a 58-year-old Mike Tyson who got paid $20 million to pretend like he's too old to throw a punch. It's really just a collection of cool-sounding words slapped onto what's actually an absolute shitter of a GPU. This 1999 graphics card is rocking a staggering 32 megabytes of VRAM in a time where people complain about having only 8 gigabytes of VRAM. Oddly enough though, the sticker says APG instead of AGP, and normally a typo like this is an obvious sign of a scam. But this is one of the only times where I would actually hope to get scammed because a fake Riva TNT2 would probably be faster than the real one. But assuming this is a legit card, I'm hoping I've got some better options to pick from. My second option is this AMD Radeon Fire Pro W4100 2GB, which released in 2014. Compared to that TNT2 M64 Vanta, it's a huge step up, though we're still dealing with some ancient tech. However, being 14 years newer than the PC itself brings up some new issues because when this PC first came out, PCI Express wasn't even a thing, as it only became mainstream in 2004, and therefore there's no way to put this GPU in any of the three AGP slots or the PCI slot. And this incompatibility issue ended up being the same problem that we would run into with the third GPU in the bag, the ATI Rage Pro Turbo, so we got one last option. And the very last option might just be the saving grace of this video, but if it doesn't work with my PC, we are cooked because I don't have very much faith in a GPU that's built into my motherboard. So that leaves us with the XFX NVIDIA GeForce Ti 4200. It ended up being perfect for the video because the goal was to age my main PC by 20 years, and guess what? I've also got an XFX GPU in my main PC. So I put the GPU right into the motherboard, plugged a power cable into the 300 watt power supply and pressed the power button, hoping that this ancient relic will actually turn on. This was supposed to be the easy part, but if you were there when I tried putting a $1,500 graphics card in a $32 PC, that challenge took me over 40 hours to complete. So to not traumatize myself again, I specifically chose to do this challenge because I thought it was gonna take me at most 20 hours to get it to work and then maybe a few more hours testing some games. But that was not even close to what actually happened. 
Initially, the plan was to connect it to my main monitor, because if I'm going to be using a terrible PC, I might as well use nice peripherals. This way, the overall gaming experience won't be that bad, but unfortunately, I don't have a DVI to DisplayPort cable or adapter, so the only solution is to just use my dad's old LG monitor. And I'm not even making this up, they actually called this thing the LG Twin Towers. Get me a refund immediately! It's only 1080p 60Hz, but it will be just fine for what we're doing today, and as long as I can still use my main keyboard and mouse, we might still be able to get a decent gaming experience. Help! My keyboard's not working! At first, I thought I needed to enable a setting in the BIOS for the USB ports in the PC to work with my peripherals, but of course, I can't turn on the setting if my keyboard doesn't work. So that's both my monitor and keyboard off the table, and now I have to use this ancient keyboard that I used to use up until 2021 when I got my very first laptop. I genuinely don't understand how I used to use this thing to shit on 9 year olds on Roblox Arsenal, and it doesn't help that some of the keys don't work anymore. But randomly out of nowhere my main keyboard started working again. Everything should be fine now, but after exiting the BIOS, I couldn't get past the floppy disk fail 40 error, which is crazy to me because I've only ever seen a floppy disk once in my life, and I don't think I've ever actually used a floppy disk before. But surprisingly, today was also not going to be my first time using a floppy disk because currently there are none inside the PC. So when I found out that the cause of this error was simply because the floppy disk was missing, I just removed it from the boot order, and honestly, I thought that was going to be the last thing I would need to do to finally get to Windows. But to my surprise, this ended up being the problem that would cause me the biggest headache in this entire video. At this point, I basically did all I could to fix the floppy disk itself, because I completely removed it from the boot order, but somehow it just kept giving me this error even though I specifically told this PC to not boot off of it. You can even see for yourself that the removable device is disabled and the IDE hard drive becomes the main boot device. The problem persisted as I restarted my PC a couple more times, so I came up with a second solution. And it might just be the most technical, intelligent, groundbreaking thing you've ever seen. F***ing around with the hard drive cables until something happened. And a thing most definitely happened, because now we have two errors. So it's time to move on to solution 3, which I should have done first, and that was to disable boot up floppy seek. And it worked! Until it didn't, because now we're on a black screen. This is because I just spent an hour fixing a problem that didn't need to be fixed, and I wouldn't know what the real problem was or how to fix it until 5 days later, when the original owner of the computer finally came home. In fact, the second my dad tried to turn it on, it just instantly booted up as if the PC was refusing to work just because it knew I was talking smack behind its back. But in all seriousness, the actual cause of the problem was my keyboard. I know, it doesn't make any sense because you can clearly tell that it was working just fine 2 seconds ago. However, computers from this era had very specific ports designed to connect a keyboard, and sadly a USB 3.0 keyboard just doesn't allow me to get past the BIOS. And I guess this explains how my dad was able to make the PC work without even having to worry about the floppy disk error. On the other hand, you might have noticed something was wrong with the PC, but a display error like this is pretty common and easy to find the solution for. And you probably don't even need me to tell you, but this is definitely a GPU error, which somehow still surprised me, even though I should have expected a 22 year old GPU to not work properly. And if you didn't already notice, we're running Windows 7. At first, it might not seem like a big deal, but I'm facing a severe security threat just by running this OS. Even having Windows 7 installed is a risk in itself, and this is due to Windows 7 having several critical security issues that will not only kill the PC you're using it on, but compromise your entire network. Unfortunately, I wasn't aware of all these risks before I tried to go online, but prior to connecting to the internet, I decided that this might be a good time to update the drivers on the GPU, or at least try to get it up to date, because again, this card was released back in 2002. Now normally, you would go to the NVIDIA or AMD website to download your graphics card drivers online because obviously those websites will have the newest drivers, but back then, upgrading your drivers with a CD was much more common. CDs in general were just a lot more common, and so I put the CD into the PC and after doing a quick Google search, I discovered a major issue. Windows 7 came out in 2009 three years after this GPU lost driver support, which means that this GPU doesn't even have drivers for this version of Windows, so the chances of it working properly are microscopically slim. Now you might wonder why I don't just downgrade my Windows version to completely avoid any and all driver issues, but Windows 7 already has tons of security flaws due to it reaching its end of life four years ago. So imagine just how bad it would be on Windows XP or Windows 98, which reached its end of life 18 years ago. Anyways, because I didn't know a thing about the security flaws before attempting this challenge, when I tried to access the internet on an outdated version of Google Chrome, my computer tried to protect me from even the safest websites, like the one you're watching this video on. I initially thought that it wasn't a big deal, until I found this red 
Reddit post. According to this post with 3.8 thousand upvotes, you'll notice that doing virtually anything on this OS is a security threat, which raised a couple of eyebrows for me. He states that there are 146 new exploits with Windows 7, but links to a website which doesn't really show 146 exploits. At least until you change the search filter and find nearly 2,000 results. Regardless, it's pretty much common sense that using an outdated version of anything without security updates can lead to huge problems like getting your internet shut off. But after using my head and realizing that a lot of huge IT companies still use outdated operating systems, including Windows 7, I just decided that I would proceed with the rest of the challenge, regardless of the risks I'm taking. And apparently, I'm not the only one willing to take that gamble. Just take a look at how many people are still on Windows 7 as of November 2024. 2.47% of all Windows users. You might think for a split second that that's not really a lot of people, but there are over 1.6 billion active Windows users right now, and if you do the math, that's over 39.5 million people still using Windows 7. More people than the entire population of Canada, the second largest country in the world. Now that everything's set up properly, it's time to optimize this PC and find out if it can still run any games after all these years. But there's just one issue. I have barely ever touched Windows 7. I make optimization guides for Windows 10 and 11. Not whatever this is. Apart from doing the basics like debloating and removing temporary files, I had no idea what to do, so I watched a couple YouTube videos and took some optimizations from each. But in the back of my mind, I highly doubted that these would make much of a difference, not because they were bad videos, but since optimizations generally affect the CPU the most. And since the GPU is the component that's bottlenecking the PC, I decided to not waste too much time optimizing my CPU and hopped right into some games. And what better way to start than my very first PC game, Sam and Max Beyond Time and Space, a point and click game released in 2007, and this is what really got me into Telltale games in the first place. The only problem with this game though is that I first played it on a 2012 Lenovo Think Center with a 2017 GT710, not this PC. If we take a look at the minimum requirements for this game, we need at least a mid range GPU from 2010, meaning that we're gonna need a miracle to even open this game on a mid range GPU from 2002. Surprisingly, we actually managed to open it without any issues. I was expecting an absolute failure, but since we're here, we might as well go all in and try running 1080p max settings. We only managed to get like 10 FPS, but when I turned down the settings, my game crashed. This happened three times in a row without fail. Every time I apply changes, my PC black screens. In any other context, this would have been a total failure, but this first result just unlocked so many possibilities for this PC. So now that I know it can handle games that should have been impossible to even launch, that really got me thinking. What other impossible challenges can it take on? So to push this PC even further, I tried to play Tomb Raider Underworld. Though this game came out a whole year later, the minimum specs for the GPU were way lower, but the GeForce 6 6800 GT was still completely out of reach for my GeForce 4 card. But it would likely run a bit smoother than Sam and Max, just because our current GPU is only 2 years behind instead of 8. But to my surprise, I wasn't even able to open the game due to a direct 3D error, despite it being a much less demanding title, at least based on the minimum specs, but Underworld is still a nice looking game if you crank it up to max settings. And after doing just a little bit of research, the only way to get past this direct 3D error is to get a new GPU, and that sucks. So I guess it's time we finally find a game that we actually meet the minimum requirements for. So I chose Tomb Raider Anniversary from 2007. We have an Intel Pentium 4, a GeForce 4 card, and 2GB of RAM. We are comfortably surpassing all the minimum requirements for the game, so nothing could go wrong, right? For once, I managed to do something on the first try, and surprisingly, it turned out even better than I expected. My normal colors came back. For weeks, I assumed the GPU was fried, but since I returned to the challenge two weeks later, I had to replug all my wires. That's when I discovered that having the DVI cable just slightly unscrewed was enough to completely mess up the colors. That was easily the most unexpected turn of events in this entire video, because my colors in the BIOS were completely fine whether or not the cable was loose. But I'm glad that issue was due to something as stupid and simple as this. And that means that the GPU had been completely intact for the past 22 years, which is honestly kind of wild. What's even wilder though, is the 5 FPS I'm getting on the main menu. It was so laggy that it took me a solid 5 minutes just to turn all the settings down. But with the game finally running over 10 FPS on this machine, it's time to actually play it. If I can just get through this tutorial level, I can finally answer the question as to whether or not this PC can play anything. 
After hours upon hours of trying to get this thing to work, running this 2007 game on a 24 year old PC was feeling really good, and I was enjoying this 24 to 30 FPS gameplay for what it was. I've never felt better completing a tutorial level, but I might just keep playing this game off camera since I'm having so much fun. But if you want to see me put a $1500 graphics card in a $32 PC, watch this video next.